So I'm going to give you the whirlwind tour of some of the um, data from our National Youth Health Surveys. And um, there's a lot of information, a lot of data and a lot of graphs. So I, I hope um, if I'm talking too fast, just raise your hand or if you don't quite understand something, let me know. So. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the Adolescent Health Research, who are my colleagues. Um, none of us have any um, paid time on the Adolescent Health Research Group, and the Youth 2000 survey really relies on people's passion and dedication to contributing to this and to publishing the information in this report. Um, and you know, we're all about making sure that young people uh, that we have good information about New Zealand's young people. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Youth 2000 survey series. So what we've done is that we've essentially done really comprehensive surveys about things that affect the well-being of young people in a number of different populations. Our biggest surveys are in our national surveys and we did that, those in 2001, 2007 and then um, in 2012. So we have data now stretching over 11 years. We did school climate surveys, which was an add-on to the 2007 and 2012 survey, which kind of wants, um, identifies what are the factors in the schools, what are the policies, what are the curricula, what are the services that are supporting those young people. Then we also looked at um, alternative education students. And these were essentially, when we first did the study in 2000, um, young people in AE were really um, not getting any services. And and so they were basically kicked out of school and put there as, you know, to kind of um, have all their health, education, social issues without any of the traditional supports of um, health and education and social services. Then we did a teen parent survey in 2006 and a Farikura survey in 2007. So we've looked at a number of different population groups. We would like to do far more. Um, watch this space. So um, back in the late 90s, we decided what we really needed was we needed good information. We were going to health providers and saying, look, young people have specific needs. People were saying to us, young people are sweet. They're the healthiest. Um, why would we want to invest resources and money in young people? So we decided to get together sort of in the mid-90s to kind of pull together Adolescent Health Research Group and we had this big dream of doing these national surveys. Um, then we got really flash and we decided we were going to do these surveys not on um, typical pen and paper tick box stuff, which is what everyone else in the world was doing. We used technology and so in the late 90s we developed um, the survey on laptops, which were the latest flashest thing. And, and, um, and we also put them in audio so that young people could hear the questions, which was really important for young people who who didn't read particularly well or people with English as second language. In 2007 we also did, um, translated all of the survey into Te Reo Māori. Then in 2007 we got flasher and we went to um, little um, stylus pens where you could select your responses and then in 2012 we used little touchpad um, iPad type um, technology. So. Um, this survey ranges, it has over 600 questions and most young people won't get to answer all of those questions but it branches. So for instance if you said you'd ever um, smoked a cigarette, you get questions about smoking cigarettes. If you didn't smoke a cigarette, you skip on to the next questions. Problem is, is that the tutu kids who were doing lots of things got lots of questions. <laughs> Um, what I kind of want to point out in this really busy um, slide is that um, thanks to Jenny, I kind of now get it, our school response rate is dropping and that's because schools are saying we're too busy, you, you want to take our kids and our space and use our power to generate all this stuff and um, so that is decreasing and I think that's a kind of capacity issue. We need to be really savvy about if we're going into schools as researchers, we need to do this together because 
principals kept saying to us, look, you're about the fifth person this week that I've had coming in wanting to do research in our school. We've had enough. Um, same with students. Was, and, when, and you notice that by A, oh, I haven't got age here, that the more senior students were kind of pressured not to take time off and come and do the survey because they had such busy um, curriculum. And I think to answer... Um, interestingly enough, if you look at this, um, young people who were saying that they had more than one ethnic group, between 2001 has moved from 29% to 42%. So in 11 years, we've got this incredibly far more ethnically diverse group of young people. Okay. So what I kind of wanted to do was start off with some of the sort of global results of some of the survey. And this is what we call our sort of eyeball, eyeball graph. And I'll, I'll talk you through it a little bit. Um, so each of these sections, so this is health, care and economics. And the red sections basically mean things have got worse. So if we look at parents worrying about not having enough money, and this line comes in, it's saying there's been a 49% increase in young people worrying, um, young people saying that their parents worry about not having enough food in the last 11 years. If we look at getting a part-time job, there has been a 38% decrease in young people saying that they can get a, a part-time job because they're competing against adults in the um, workforce. Um, if we look at here, GP access, it's an 11% decrease in young people being able to access um, primary care and being able to ex access health care has reduced 11%. The other areas that have worsened are good well-being and depressive symptoms and they've reduced by, you know, by 3%. But um, important, um, if we look at the sexual health segment here, we can see that condom use has decreased by 7% over the last 11 years. What is really interesting is that grey dots are basically no change. So in the last 11 years we've seen no change in contraception use. We would have expected to see some improvement, maybe, maybe not. The areas overwhelmingly though in this spoke are green. And I think that that's a really important message. Young people have made huge strides in substance use. And so in terms of um, ever smoking a cigarette, there's been a 56% reduction in young people ever smoking a cigarette, a 44% reduction in young people ever um, who are binge drinking, 40% um, reduction in young people using marijuana. So they've made actually huge improvements. And actually depressingly listening to Jenny, I'm like, well, it's certainly not the health education that's doing it. <laughs> um, but um, actually young people are making far better decisions. And if we look at the biggest colour of young people, they're driving much better. Um, and maybe that's to do with a lot of the, the legislation around... Um, you know, safer roads, um, licensing, graduated driver's licensing and things like that. But overwhelmingly, we can see that, you know, compared to 11 years ago, our young people are making much better, healthier decisions. If we look at this from Māori, the same pattern is happening, making huge progress. So while there are disparities, Māori compared to Māori young people now, compared to 11 years ago, are doing far better. If we look specifically at sexual health, at the sexual health wedge here, currently sexually active it has seen a 21% reduction. And so when you were talking about the fertility rates, it's not actually, I actually think that it's young people delaying sexual activity, and we know that young people, as they delay sexual activity, are far more likely to make more responsible decisions than younger students. Um, if we look at condom use and contraception use, no change. Once again, we're not making a difference, we're not doing anything here. 
So um, I just wanted to kind of quickly go through some of the evidence from Youth 2000 about what actually makes a difference for young people. And broadly those are things around supportive um, relationships, really strong whānau connections and um, good school climate. So even if they're not necessarily um, getting the content, having a good school climate makes a huge difference to young people's health outcomes. And having access to healthcare, and particularly I'm going to talk about school-based healthcare. So um, this is just some of the examples of research that we've had published around family connection. So. Um, um, this was just earlier this year, we got some stuff um, that basically found that um, young Māori men were more likely to use condoms if they were, had close supportive family relationships. Asian students were less likely to smoke if they had good family relationships. There were fewer suicide attempts, there were um, people had more sustained weight loss, they were eating healthier and having family meals together was associated with fewer depressive symptoms and better family communication. So just the impact of having whānau and family communication and feeling cared for and loved for, loved by your family actually makes a huge difference across all areas of well-being for young people. Now I was talking yesterday to um, Robert and I was talking to him about Pacific young people and he was saying well you know a lot of our Pacific young fam our families, our parents don't feel comfortable, they don't have the language or they don't have the knowledge to be able to talk to their young people about sexual and reproductive health but what he said was that actually it's more about young people knowing that their parents care a lot about them, that they'll be there if the shit hits the fan or things go wrong that they can go to their families but but also that their families can say, look, I don't know much about this, but I can help you find somebody who does. And so um, I don't think we have to put all the responsibility on families to kind of have the knowledge, but being sort of giving those reinforcing messages that family support is really important and improves health across a range of issues. We went, then we looked at school connection and it's associated with less bullying, increased safety, encouraging people from different ethnic groups to get on, uh, less alcohol problems, violence, unsafe sexual behaviours and increased physical activity and, um, and sports team participation. So feeling well connected to your school, feeling safe in your school are all things that create really positive well-being for young people. Then um, just this year we've, rest, um, we've published a report around school-based healthcare and what we did was that we, I, we looked at the qualities, um, the schools that had really good school-based health services and looked at what their health outcomes were. And what we found was that schools that had good health services, which are these sort of bullet points down here, actually had um, students with fewer depressive symptoms, fewer suicide attempts, and females were more likely to use contraception. So really clearly stating that having good school-based health services where young people are actually at, um, and that's accessible makes a real difference. In particular, having the, the health professional ratio to, um, of 10 hours per 100 students was associated with reduced pregnancies in schools. So it's really saying you can't just do your one or fly in, fly out sort of stuff. It's actually more about being in the school system, being part of the school system and, um, and actually having sufficient time to be able to do stuff. So overall most young people are doing well but um, if we think about the social determinants of health what I like is that it's talking about the conditions of which people are born, grow, live, work and age and I'm just going to kind of walk you through some of the conditions that our young people live in, in particular those young people who are poor in our survey. So I'm using the New Zealand Deprivation Index and um, if we just look at um, it's it's, it's the opposite to school decile. So decile 10, um, 
is basically high deprivation or poor young people and one de um, decile one is um, low deprivation or more wealthier communities. So if we look at this graph, conditions where young people live in their homes. So we know that moving home frequently is associated with, more, with poorer outcomes. Poorer young people, um, which is in the green here, and the blue is wealthier young people, and these um, red ones are in the middle. We see that poorer young people are more likely to have moved home two or more times. They're more likely to have neither parent working, more likely to have more than two people per bedroom, so have an overcrowded, technically overcrowded home. And um, their family often or always worry about not having enough food. So young people from poorer communities are significantly more likely to worry about um, that. But interestingly enough, so are the low deprivation and mid deprivation students as well. If we look at um, where young people are sleeping and their families are sleeping, look at this. So high poorer young uh, young people from poorer communities are more likely to live in um, sleep in their living room and sleep in a garage. And we know that actually those places are often, you know, they don't give young people space. How are you supposed to do your homework? How are you, you know, overcrowding issues are pretty significant. Um, the other thing is, is that young people who are poorer tend to con contribute to their family more often. So they're more likely to do work around the home because someone is sick or disabled. They're more likely to look after younger siblings and younger family members, and they're more likely um, for, for more than one hour a day, and they're more likely to do family household chores for more than one hour a day. So they contribute far more to um, their whānau. If we look at this graph, I think this is a really important graph. Um, there is a perception that poor families are dysfunctional and don't care about their kids. And this very clearly says that that's crap. Okay? Poor families care just as much about their, um, their um, kids as everyone else does. If we look at um, However, if we look at time, poorer families said that they got, um, poorer young people said that they got less time with their families and hardly ever got t enough time with their father. And the most common reasons were they were too busy with the younger children um, and that they were at work all the time. If we look at violence, we can see, you know, poorer young people are far more likely to witness adults hitting other children at home. They're more, um, they're more likely to see adult witness adults hitting other adults at home, and they're more likely to report sexual abuse and coercion. If we look at school, we can see that student feels um, that um, what's nice about this one is that it's saying that poorer students feel that they um, that they like school a lot and they're slightly more likely to feel part of their school. And interestingly enough, um, we know that truancy is much higher in um, high deprivation areas, but young people are saying that it's important for them to attend school the same as other um, deprivation levels. If we look at um, adults at school who care, once again, another good news story. Young people in poorer communities are saying, actually, um, their teachers care about them more, but they are more, less likely, and um, they're more likely to say their teachers are unfair. Um, if we look specifically at sexual health, I want, if we look at, um, this is, um, ever had sex, and this is 2001, 2007, and 2012. Dramatic reduction in young people saying that they've ever had sex. If we look at, um, con um, at um, condoms to, to prevent STIs, we can see that there's been a, a decrease there, and there's not much change in contraception use. If we look at this by deprivation, Poorer young people are more likely to have sex and be currently sexually active. 
Um, what's really striking about this one is that there is a really big difference around access to contraception for young people who are poor. Really significant difference between mid and um, low deprivation and high deprivation students. Not a whole lot of ch di ch uh, difference for condom use, but contraception is really significantly different. Um, pregnancy is declining and that's kind of supporting stuff that um, we, that's been said earlier and um, it's more common in poorer communities and um, but STIs there was no difference by um, socioeconomic status. I just wanted to highlight here that if we look at um, where young people go to get their health care most young people go to um, their primary care provider but if you're poor, what's interesting, the only group that the, the most, the, the area that's important here is school health clinics. So poorer young people are more likely to use school health services than less um, wealthy um, students. Uh, about 4% of young people had difficulty accessing sexual health care and Māori reported more difficulty. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of other studies um, from using our data which basically said that Māori are over twice the odds of um, experiencing ethnic discrimination by a health professional, so that's us out there and um, young people's perception. Pacific young people over three times the odds and Asian young people over three times the odds. So young people are saying that they aren't being treated fairly by health care services. If we look at the Māori report, there are specific, or, um, there are ongoing health disparities. And if we look at same-sex attracted youth, there are also huge disparities. And amongst transgender students, um, the uh, paper that we've just published and we got a bit of media stuff around um, was basically highlighting the huge disparities for transgender young people. So, um, Lots of data, but what I kind of want to say is that addressing sexual health requires a big picture approach. It's not just about, you know, um, having good treatment, and it's not just having about having a good clinic. It's about um, healthy families. It's about healthy communities. It's about um, good education, and it's about fairness across. Um, <coughs> A fair New Zealand, really. I just wanted to finish with this slide, and um, and I, I kind of think it's important because I keep hearing this level playing field. Everyone has an opportunity to thrive. What we know from this data is that actually, you know, there's a large proportion of our young people who have all these extra burdens, who don't live in safe houses, who have to contribute more to their families, who don't have the financial resources, who don't know how to access services, and when they do try to access services, they feel discriminated against. So this is not a level playing field. Um, <coughs> I think we have to really think carefully about how we provide care and that different groups require different strategies. You know, overall we're doing much better for our young people, but there are really vulnerable groups who aren't doing so well within that context. And we need to make sure that we are addressing the specific needs of those young people to make sure that we do have really responsive services that are appropriate and address the needs of these young people. They do need a bit of a hand up. Not all of us get a fair go. Okay. Um, so that's my challenge to you all in sexual health, is to kind of think about things more creatively. Look at the big picture and see how sexual health is part of the big picture. Um, Nami yukiakwe, no reira tina koutou, tina koutou, tina koutou katoa.